All right, so uh, welcome to the second session of the conference. Um, the first talk will be by Henrik Johansson, and he will tell us about color kinematics, duality, the root of gravity. Thank you. Thank you, Radu, and uh, thanks to all the organizers for putting this together. It's, it's a great pleasure to be back in um, KATP virtually. Um, all right, so I will, I will um, give a presentation which is based on our recent review from last uh, September. So in some sense, it will be a review of a review. Um, so I apologize to some people which are probably already expert on, on many of the things I will discuss, but I will also hope I will have some um, more recent uh, new interesting um, comments, uh, side comments here and there. All right. Um, so let me start by this motivating slide, which I usually slow, show. Uh, so this is actually from, um, largely it's from uh, DeWitt's paper from 67, where he um, wrote up the FIMA rules for um, GR. Um, and it's quite, it's quite uh, disgusting if you get into the details. Um, the, um, the propagator is not so bad, but the interaction terms are quite bad. So for example, the cubic vertex has roughly 100 terms on the order of 100 terms, and uh, uh, the higher order vertices have uh, maybe 1,000 terms at four point. Um, and this makes calculations very difficult. You can work out an ex explicit example roughly on, on how many terms you will get, uh, how many orders um, of uh, orders of magnitude that we get. So for example, this uh, three loop diagram will be really disgusting. Um, but we know that, of course, that um, traditional way of doing calculation of gravity can be uh, greatly uh, improved by just looking at on-shell quantities directly. So, so here, for example, we can see that it's, for example, if you just look at asymptotic states, we can realize that we can factorize the spin two state into a spin one state, and this is very explicitly done using polarization vectors in this case. Also, if you look at the interaction, the three-point interaction, it will factorize into simpler constituents, um, which are, uh, for an on-shell amplitude, is our individual gauge invariant, but here I've written them in terms of the usual um, what, that you might recognize as Young Mills vertices. And we also know that the factorize, if you look at higher point interaction like this one, it factorizes into the Young Mills amplitude at four point. And all, all of this process, all of this formulas are, should be quite familiar um, to many of the people in the audience. And this is basically saying that gravity processes are in some sense square of the gauge theory ones. And this formalism has, has several names. It's uh, one of them is KLT from the 80s, uh, one of them is BCA from uh, 10 years ago, and then CHY more recently. They all make manifest these properties. Um, and if you go back to the origin of KLT in 86, um, uh, here I have a picture, a cartoon, um, and we can just think of the bosonic open string amplitude that I've written out here. And, and we can, what KLT did is that they showed that by suitable contour deformation, uh, of the of the remus of of the integration over the remus sphere, you can actually break it up into uh, permutations of integrations on the boundary of two half spheres or disks, um, and you get something like look at this this formula here. And I'm not going to write out the details. I think many of you know it, but but this KLT kernel or momentum kernel is some polynomial of the Mannesheim invariance. <laughs> well, more generally. It's the polynomial of, of uh, sine of uh, times alpha prime of the minus time invariance, but in the field theory limit, it becomes SIJ. So in, in the field theory limit, this closed string amplitude become uh, a gravity amplitude, um, and therefore this provided a very easy way of doing calculations uh, for many years. Um, but more recently, we actually we have actually a more interesting ways of doing calculations in string theory itself. So here I'm just flashing some of the more recent results. Um, I will get back to it later on in this talk, but let me just flash it in front of you, is that now we have many ways of doing string tree level uh, calculations uh, through some kind of double copy, uh, which uses a string component and a QFT component. And, and the double copy is actually not the one that originally was described by KLT, but it's the field theory limit of the KLT. Uh, so doing this, uh, I can, you can draw this table here. It's a three by three table where you have the, the Q of T series here and you have the string theories here. 
Um, and I will come back to what these precisely are later on. But right now I'm just flashing it as the motivation uh, why um, we have made a lot of progress in the last few years. All right, but let's let's get to the the pun in my title. So the square root of gravity. Uh, that is uh, what we think of. Well, I think about it as being color kinematics duality. So I'm just going to explain color kinematics duality in the, in the most simple context that we have, which is 4.3 level. Um, so consider Young Mills at 4.3 level. We know that we can expand it in terms of the ST and U channel. And here I have absorbed the contact uh, diagrams into the, the channels themselves. So for example, I can very explicitly uh, display the S channel numerator. This is simply the cubic Feynman diagram in one vertex. This is the cubic Feynman diagram in other vertex, just using some momentum conservation identities to rewrite it more compactly. Then I added this term here, which, which can realize is a contact term because it's proportional to S. This is just a usual contact term in, in Yang Mills. And so using this expression, what you can do is you can analyze what happens under a gauge transformation. So I just uh, shift uh, the gauge field by a scalar field, or in terms of amplitude, I just uh, replace the polarization vector by a momentum. And what happens to this numerator? Well, it won't vanish uh, because it's not a gauge invariant quantity. An individual, individual diagram is not gauge invariant, but it will become proportional uh, to the propagator, inverse propagator. So in this case, in the S channel, it will become proportional to S. And the time sampling, which is actually completely cyclical, uh, so we can, for most part of it, ignore it. But now when we add all uh, three diagrams together, we notice that all of them, the pole would cancel, we get some completely local. It will be proportional to this function here, and it will be proportional to the Jacobi, sorry, proportional to three color factors, the color factor I showed here. And this we can recognize as being the Jacobi identity for FABC structure constants. Uh, so we know that this identity has to be true if this amplitude is supposed to be gauge invariant. And luckily, since FA, FABC comes from a Lie algebra, it, it is true. But now we can see uh, what happens that if we demand that there's an additional structure in Young Mills, that not only are the color factors adding up to zero, but also maybe the numerator factors adding up to zero. Uh, then you get something uh, very in interesting, and it turns out that we can, on, on the one hand, interpret it as being some kind of kinematic Jacobi identity, and we'll see that in, in, in gravity it will have something to do with uh, diffeomorphism invariance. Uh, so let's let's look at gravity a bit closer. Uh, so the claim in in the paper uh, roughly 10 years ago, or I guess 12 years ago now, is that um, if you impose this identity and this identity at the same time. Uh, then these al are algebraically the same identity, so you're justified to swap color for kinematics. And then you get something that looks like this. And what you have done then is that you have replaced the polarization vectors by polarization tensors, because you have two of them. You also double up the number of derivatives, so you have two derivative interactions rather than one derivative interaction. And you will also have diffeomorphism invariance, which is basically inherited from the gauge invariance. You can see that this is roughly a product of a polarization vector and uh, momentum. So you can see it very clearly. If I do the same gauge transformation, I replace the polarization tensor with this combination here. You can see that it, again, using the same identities that I had on the previous slide, it will decompose into something proportional to the sum of these three numerators times the same function as before. So if this combination is zero, uh, I just showed you that the gravity or the um, the tentative gravity amplitude is uh, zero, and it precisely um, does have the properties of a gravity theory if this is zero. So this is this is um, a very good way to think about why do we impose some kind of numerator identities? Well, it's because we want to have diffeomorphism invariance when we do the double copy, right? Um, and the question is, uh, well, when, one question is when, which has been around for a very long time and hasn't really been properly answered is what is this um, interesting kinematic identity that we see? Could it be due to some kinematic Lie algebra or some more general structure, a mathematical structure? Um, well, I think it's, it's, it's fair to say that if we observe that this kinematic identity is holds for all multiplicity at tree level, there surely should be some 
mathematical structure, at least a tree level that explains it. Um, and if you have this algebra, whatever it is, it should dramatically simplify calculations, for example, in GR, um, which, which I said is very complicated. So what is known? Well, uh, so if you go back to 2011, there was this uh, interesting paper by Donald uh, O'Connell and Ricardo Montero, uh, where they show that if you look at self diagonals, it actually already satisfies this algebra. And you can, you can make it very explicit by introducing this generator, which takes the form of a plane wave plus some operator here. And then you can just show that if you commute these two guys, uh, you get something that you can call um, a structure constant, and then you get the generator with uh, shifted momenta, which is just some, some of the momenta. Um, and, well, it, it looks very much like a Lie algebra. Well, maybe in this mathematical strict sense, it's not a Lie algebra because it's not a finite number of generators. It's an infinite number of generators because they're labeled by momenta. But it, it's, it's very similar to, um, uh, well, as a physicist, I, I would, I would be happy to call it a Lie algebra. Um, now, um, if, we, if we fast forward in time and go to last year, there's actually been quite a lot of progress in terms of understanding how to write up something that behaves like this up all the way up to next to MHV level uh, for Young Mills uh, tree level amplitudes. I'm not going to go into the details because the details, well, you can read it in this paper. Uh, they're a bit messy, so they don't fit the, the, the format of this uh, uh, talk, but I can I can basically illustrate the general idea. idea is that the idea is that we introduce something that we call currents, and then we, we introduce something that looks something like it looks like a current algebra in momentum space. Uh, but we basically we take products of what we call a vector generator, uh, and then we recover a, a vector generator times some products of polarizations and momenta. But we also get tensor generators. So one way to think of this is that we have introduced additional states or uh, fields which correspond to tensors. And this is, was sufficient to actually go up to rank three tensor to generate the next to MHV um, enumerators uh, to all multiplicity. Um, so, so we made a lot of progress. But what I will discuss a little bit more is something which came between these two papers. And this is the, the work by uh, Clifford Chong and uh, Xiao Shen. Uh, so what they did is that they introduced a cubic Lagrangian that manifests color kinematics duality. And so the Lagrangian is given here. Uh, he has a, a, a vector field uh, that transforms into a joint, a Z, and then he has a conjugate one called X, and then he has a scalar field which also transforms into a joint called Y. Uh, but the funny thing is about this Lagrangian is that it, well, it looks like it's described as some kind of vector scalar system, but it turns out that in this paper, they actually used it to describe a nonlinear sigma model pions. Um, and <clears throat> this can be done by uh, basically either considering external states of the scalar or considering the longitudinal mode of the Z boson. Uh, but the it obeys color kinematics duality, so it gave, it gave uh, basically numerators uh, amplitudes that obeys color kinematics duality. Uh, but another thing that was later observed, actually, in this paper here, is that it also gives the Mills tree level amplitudes if you restrict to the MHV sector. Uh, and in order to do that, you have to be a bit more precise about what kind of um, uh, polarization vectors that you use. You have to you have to impose certain gauge conditions on the polarization vectors, but then you can get it to describe the MHV sector. Um, uh, but what I could say that more precisely is that if you look at the Young-Mills numer numerator, it has certain terms uh, which you can separate out. You have, you have terms, for example, where you have a dot product between the polarization vector of leg one and leg n, and this, this should be leg one and this should be leg n here. And then it has dot products between polarization and momenta. So if you only look at these terms, is Lagrangian precisely compute those terms, and it computes in such a way that it obeys color kinematics duality. Uh, so, for example, this this diagram here, this could these are the Feynman diagrams of this theory, and they literally obey these identities. Uh, so, I find it a very interesting Lagrangian, um, and in some sense, it, it defines the kinematic algebra in terms of these interactions here. Um, but as as uh, to this date, we still don't have a general description of the kinematic algebra beyond the next to MHV sector, so that's an open problem. 
All right, let's discuss double copies a bit more, what kind of theories we can have. Uh, so the, the simplest theory that we can consider is axion dilaton gravity, um, or in, in our dimension it would be rather a B field rather than uh, axion. So you can just look at the states. You can see that you can easily you can construct the polarization and tensors uh, uh, through double copying the graviton. You pick out the traceless symmetric here, and, and then you pick out this anti-symmetric here, and you pick out the trace to get the dilaton. And you can show by computing amplitudes that the amplitudes by double copying pure Young mills is consistent with um, this Lagrangian here, and you might recognize it as being the same Lagrangian as you encounter, for example, in string theory. But here we don't necessarily work in 10D, so we, for example, we can work in 4D, which would be more natural, and then we get the Lagrangian, which has a dilaton um, and an axion. Uh, at tree level, we can actually truncate away the dilaton and axion by just realizing that there's a Z2 symmetry that allows for truncation, uh, but that doesn't work at loop level, of course. In, in the loops, they will propagate. However, if you want to get the pure GR theory, we can get it. Um, so what we have to do is that we have to start with the Young Mills times Young Mills double copy, which have a dilaton and axion, and then we have to deform each side. So the way we deform it is by actually adding more states, and this is just going to be massless quarks that we add. We add them in a fundamental representation because we want to separate them out from the adjoint particles um, of the gluons, right? And then we do the double copy where we match the adjoint particles and we match the fundamental with anti-fundamental. Uh, and then we get, what we get is we get gravity plus a certain number of scalars. And this is, you can think of it as we have aligned the spin of the massless fermion to be anti-aligned with the, or helicited with the other fermions such that we get scalars. And the number of scalars that we get is, param is controlled by this NF parameter, the number of fundamental particles, and it comes out to be this number. Uh, <clears throat> so, so one thing we actually see here is that we, if you pick this to be negative one, this term will cancel. It looks like that's a cheap way to do it, but it's actually a consistent way to do it because actually what happens is that now we have to insert a minus sign each time we have a loop of these fermions, and that actually can be reinterpreted as saying that we have ghosts. And these ghosts are there to cancel the unwanted states. Um, so for example, if you look at this particular one loop example, we can get the pure GR calculation amplitude or numerator by double copying Young Mills and then subtracting out fermion times uh, antifermion. Uh, and this can be generalized to different amount of supersymmetry. That's why I just have to have it generically to be mattered. A third example is uh, let's, let's couple Young Mills theory to Einstein gravity itself. So we get something like Young Mills Einstein uh, gra uh, gravity. Um, uh, these are very similar to heterotic double copies um, and, or heterotic KLT formulas. So the way we do it is that we keep Young Mills <coughs> as it is on one side and we add a scalar to the other side. And this scalar, we have a self interaction of uh, lambda phi cube type. And then we can see that we have two types of states now. Uh, we have the graviton and we have a vector, which is just the vector times the scalar. Uh, we also have the dilaton and axion, but let me neglect uh, those particles for now. And then we can compute loop level diagrams. For example, here we can have a four vector amplitude with a graviton propagating internally. Uh, and this is just this pure Young Mills diagram times uh, a scalar self interacting here and then emitting a gluon here. So this has been done and it works successfully. It works for any number of supersymmetry. Uh, but as I said before, this uh, N equals zero, one, two, Young Mills Einstein supergravities, they all have axion dilaton states. Um, and we don't know how to get rid of them uh, as, uh, at this uh, moment in time. Maybe you can, but there's also, you can make an argument that they, they are quite natural because you would expect that the dilaton has something to do with gauge coupling and the axion has something to do with the theta parameter. So it's, it's a bit hard to see how to get rid of them. Uh, maybe it can be done, but we don't know how to do it at the moment. Also, I should say that this construction quite easily extends to a spontaneous sim sim supersymmetry breaking, where you, uh, <clears throat> for example, some of these scalars, or sorry, you, add, you introduce extra scalars on both sides, and then you can go on the Coulomb branch. So that, that uh, most easily is done in the supersymmetric series where you have extra scalars, 
but it can also be done in the non-supersymmetric theory by just introducing more scalars. All right, uh, I should also point out that not double copy and color kinematics duality does not always work, and, and sometimes it's, it doesn't work for very important reasons. Um, so sometimes we, we don't discuss the cases where it doesn't work because from, from, from my point of view, it's simply not interesting. But sometimes it is. So here's an interesting example. Um, so imagine that we double copy Young Mills, time checking Mills plus N adjoint fermions. Now, if you just look at the state count and, and maybe three point interactions, we, you would naively guess this would be gravity plus N number of uh, spin three half particles. Now, if you go to the supergravity literature or any literature related to spin three half, uh, you would conclude that this has to be gravitinos. And therefore, you would expect that you can at most have eight of them. Um, so what goes wrong here? Well, th what goes wrong here is that this theory here, the gauge theory, Young Mills plus N adjoint fermions, does not obey color kinematics duality. Um, and you can see that it only obeys color kinematics duality if N is less or equal to four. Um, and which we also happens to know, we know that that's of course also the maximum number of supersymmetries in the gauge theory. And this was actually shown in this paper by Gaderology uh, and Royban. They, can sh they show that actually the kinematic Jacobi identity that you get from color kinematic duality is the same field identity that is needed to enforce supersymmetry. Uh, so things work very nice even when things does not work. So that's good. Um, all right, so from this review, we had this picture of various different double copies that you can obtain, and I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, I would advise you to just go to the paper and, and have a look at this picture. Uh, here I have a slide which is quite messy, but it sort of emphasizes what kind of generalizations of the double copy has been done in, in the recent years. Uh, so I would say that the, the first one, which was a generalization of the original paper, was that we went from tree to loops. But other important generalizations was that we started considering double copy series which are not truncations of any eight supergravity. And that's an important generalization because if, if it's just, if we're just talking about any eight supergravity and its truncations, well, then we're not doing more than what KLT originally done, did, right? Because um, from KLT, you can get anything which is a truncation of any cosate supergravity. Um, but we have extended that. So we have theories which do not have an obvious uh, string theory interpretation. We also have uh, gauge theories with fundamental matter, as I just showed you on, on some previous slide. Um, for example, QCD, masses QCD, massive QCD. So they, they obey color kinematics duality. And as I said, we have spontaneously broken theories. And this is both the gauge symmetry being broken, as in the Coulomb branch case, or supersymmetry being break, broken spontaneously in a gravity theory, supergravity theory. There's also some interesting work on form factors and CFT correlators, and I think much less is understood here, except that for form factors, people have been able to compute up to five loops, uh, Young-Mills form factors, which are based color kinematics, which is very impressive. There's some work on off-shell symmetries. This has mostly been done at the free theory, free theory level. Uh, and then classical black hole solutions, which we already heard a bit about. And in the next talk, we'll hear about gravitation and radiation and potentials. This work on amplitudes and curved background, also quite um, not so much, but it's very promising results. And there's, C there's CHY, there's scalar EFTs. There's new double copies from string theory, which I will discuss, there's conformal gravity. Just a few days ago, there was a double copy for the celestial amplitude. So there's a lot of things happening. Now, um, <clears throat> what I'm interested in is actually understanding what kind of double copies can we get. Uh, and it sometimes it's very hard to, to identify what is the proper double copy. So uh, it's easy to actually to understand if we have some additional structure like supersymmetry. So if you have supersymmetry, we can more, identi we're more easily identify the correct theory. For example, if we have n equals eight, sorry, if we have n equals four and n equals four, it's pretty obvious that the only theory it could possibly be is n equals eight supergravity. And likewise, if you reduce n equals four on one side, if you reduce it to n equals one or n equals two, there's also only one candidate theory that it could be. And the reason is that these theories are unique. There's no free parameters. And here I'm considering what's known as ungauged supergravity. I will come back to the gauge case in a moment. 
But if you go down below n equals five, so if you go to n equals four or n equals three, then there's a little bit of freedom, but the freedom is very minimal. The freedom is just that you have the right to introduce vectors. So you have a parameter, which is the number of vectors. So again, what it means is that it's actually quite easy to identify which series we're talking about. But then if you go down to n equals two supergravity, it becomes more complicated. Um, but it's actually well known, there's a well-known way, way to classify n equals two supergravity series. And, and this relies on, first of all, considering series that has a five-dimensional uplift. Um, so this is, many of the series that we're interested in have a five-dimensional uplift. And then you, you look at the three-point interactions in this series, uh, and then you can uniquely specify it from that. So basically from the, from the three-point amplitudes. Uh, and the reason why we go to 5D is that while in 4D you actually have infinitely many parameters in the in the superpotential, so that's a bit more complicated. But let's let's have a closer look at this series of n equals two type that we can uplift uh, to 5D. So first of all, let's look at the gauge theory. So let me just point out: in order to do the gravity calculation, we need to do first do the gauge theory calculations. So here I'm just flashing in front of you a calculation that we did a couple of years ago. Where we, where we computed the, the n equals two super QCD two loop calculation. And it was done uh, for any, for the, at four point level, but including planar and non-planar, any number of uh, uh, sub, uh, hypers in the loop. So the, this dark lines are basically, the solid lines are the hypers. Um, and I'm, I'm just flashing in front of you some of the numerators that we computed. It turns out that they're very simple. Uh, they can be written in terms of uh, gamma traces. Uh, this is a chiral gamma trace. There's some additional state-dependent factors, but let me not go into details. Uh, if you actually want to see these numerators, I, I advise you to go to this paper here where it was actually found that they were traces. The original calculation has slightly more complicated expression, but it turned out that they were all equivalent to traces. Um, and I can also say that in this gauge theory calculation, we integrated it and got a result for the two-loop amplitude, and this is something very familiar to LANS, uh, but let me not go into details because uh, I'm running out of time. So instead, let me tell you what's the use of this uh, two-loop numerators. Well, the use of it is that now we can get various different supergravity double copies. So for example, one easy thing that we can do is that we can do, we can take the numerators that I just showed you for n equals two super QCD, and we can double copy it with Feynman diagrams. Uh, for example, four, four dimensional Feynman diagrams where this is just a gluon, this is just a quark. So this is basically massless QCD. And it turns out that if, as long as one side obeys color kinematic duality, then the other side just can be Feynman diagrams. Not, it's, it's sufficient that one side obeys color kinematic duality. So if you do this double copy, what you will get is actually what's known as uh, Luciani model or also, also known as minimally coupled uh, supergravity in 4D. Uh, but this you can repeat because this n equals two super QCD has an uplift to 5D, so you can repeat the same exercise in 5D. So this Feynman rule is slightly different than the 4D ones because there's additional states. Uh, and then what you get something which is called generic non-Jordan family. Uh, so this is a family because an, you can have arbitrary number of, uh, of quarks here. You can, you can repeat the same thing in 6D. You, you get something which is called generic Jordan family. Uh, of course, you can consider this theory dimension reduced back to 4D, but if, you, if, you're, if you're keen on thinking of it as 6D, it actually turns out that this theory is a theory which only contains self-dual tensors, um, abelian tensors um, interacting with gravitons. Uh, well, self-dual tensor multiplets in, in, interacting with graviton multiplets. So there's no other matter, no other matter multiplet than tensors. So that's quite a nice, interesting theory. Okay, so there's, is, I have a slide here with a lot more details, but maybe in light of time, I should probably uh, not discuss all the details here. Let me just say that we classified this two-dimensional space of uh, homogeneous uh, supergravities. Uh, which are basically given by this Lagrangian, where this, Lagran where this Lagrangian has a free parameter, which is the C tensor, CIJK, totally symmetric tensor. If you pick this C tensor to be um, some uh, gamma matrix in higher dimension, then you get uh, the result of the Witten from Proyen, where they classify the most general homogeneous scalar manifold. 
And it turns out that we can reproduce that uh, from the gauge theory point of view. And this is just going to be the um, this is just going to be the Yukawa couplings in the gauge theory. And then we can get the whole slew of interesting theories. So some of the theories I already showed you: the Luciani model, generic non-Jordan family, generic Jordan family. But we also get this magical series, which only there's only four of them. So this is magical n equals two supergravity. There's a real one, there's a complex one, quaternionic one, and octonionic one. And you can see that this actually corresponds to picking uh, the non-supersymmetric theory to live in different dimensions. And you can see that this octo octonionic one actually lives in 14 dimensions. And this is why this theory does not have a known uh, you, cannot, you cannot obtain this theory from string theory in a known way um, because first it's a supersymmetric theory uh, and then, well, it's, yeah, it has fermions on both sides, even though one of the sides is not supersymmetric. Uh, so this is not known how to get that from string theory. So it's interesting. It's a very clear example where we can get something which is not directly coming from string theory. What about ungauged? Sorry, what about gauge supergravity? Because I had this small caveat here that I was only considering ungauged supergravity. So indeed, we can consider gauge supergravity. So in a very simplest example, <clears throat> we introduce a U1 gauging, and the way we do it is that we we look at the gravitinos, uh, and then we 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 want to make them charged under some vector, uh, one a single U1 vector. So we introduce this covariant derivative. <clears throat> we also uh, this is in the gravity theory. We also add some additional terms in the Lagrangian just to not explicitly break supersymmetry. <clears throat> but it turns out if you work in flat space, you have to break supersymmetry at least spontaneously. So that we do, and what we, we get is then massive gravitini. So one, one way to think of this gauge supergravity is that it's just spontaneous supersymmetry breaking in the gravity theory. And then in the double copy, we identified that this supergravity is simply a product of a Higgs uh, specifically, a Coulomb branch Yang Mills theory <coughs> uh, and uh, a, a super Yang Mills theory where the supersymmetry is spontaneously broken. And this where it makes perfect sense just when you look at the states because, well, the gravitino should be massive. So the gravi gravitino has a, <coughs> has a vector index and has a spinner index. Well, the vector index can be associated with a W boson. Uh, and, and the spinner index can be associated with a spinner here. So it makes perfect sense that you have to break uh, gauge symmetry on one side and you break supersymmetry on the other side. So here's a very exam simple example. You can do a n equals eight uh, U1 gauging by simply taking n equals four on the Coulomb branch and double copying with the massive version of the n equals two supercuicid theory, which I, which I described before, where the quarks are massive, basically. All right, uh, I'm probably running out of time, right? So I, I should probably just... Yeah, so you, you strictly speaking have minus three minutes. Yeah, so I'm gonna skip all of these slides, but if somebody wants to look at them, we can look at them later on. So let me just get to the summary. <coughs> so, so what I try to show you here in this talk is that color kinematics duality lies at the root of gravity in many different senses. So it, first of all, it makes perturbative GR simple because it, well, first of all, it simplifies the gauge theory calculations and then expresses gravity in terms of the gauge theory uh, uh, num numerators. It also allows for a simpler classification of gravity series because we can, we can boil down the classification problem in gravity series to the classification problem in the gauge theory, which is simpler. Also, there's <clears throat> this kinematic al supposed kinematic algebra, uh, which is still quite well hidden, but presumably it's a gem if somebody can find it, it would actually increase our understanding of GR and Jing Mills uh, quite a lot. But there's lots, lots of more work that remains. For example, in, in just in this very simple, uh, particular example of gauge supergravities, we, we can do different gauging. We can do gauging of the R symmetry. We can pick a compact uh, group, compact uh, global group to engage it, or we can pick a non-compact group so we've we basically done this one, we've done this one. So the compact one is just Einstein and Mills. This one is the gauge R symmetry. This one has not been done. Also, we have not worked, we have worked only in fat space. So in order to preserve supersymmetry, you actually have to work in curved space uh, because ADS vectra preserves supersymmetry. 
So that's something that needs to be done. Um, and there is some work, of course, has been done in curved background, but I think ADS is, is not quite there yet. And then there's some work on string act, string calculation, string amplitudes, which I didn't have time to go into details, but if somebody has a question, they can ask me again. Uh, and then the final punchline is that the topic of double copy color kinematics has grown much in the last three years. And unfortunately, this 30 minutes talk is too short to cover it all. So I have to stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Henrik. Um, are there any questions for Henrik? Uh, this is uh, uh, Nima, Henrik. Uh, Lance, Can I please. A, uh, yeah, sorry, I, I can't seem to raise my hand. I think, um, uh, yeah. so I, I, have a, I have a question that I'm, I'm sure I've asked uh, many years ago, and I, I, I maybe it has a, uh, uh, maybe it has a, it's been answered nicely in the, in the work since, but uh, I, I missed it. Um, so one very, very uh, basic feature of the uh, double copy, even let's say we, we talk about uh, uh, N equals four uh, super animals double copy to N equals eight, is that um, the gravity theory has lots of sort of emergent properties that we don't see in the Yang Mills. Um, so for, I mean, most obviously, we have an, uh, we only many we only manifest an SU4 cross SU4 R symmetry, um, but we know that when we get n equals eight, it's enhanced to n equals eight. Or um, on the Yang Mills side, there's no such thing as sort of universal multi gluon soft limits, but on the gravity side, there certainly are multi graviton soft limits again because the coupling is the dimensionful, and in the supersymmetric context. There are multi-scalar soft limits that let us see the E77 symmetry and, and, and things like that. So, um, is there any is there is there any understanding for how we see the emergent E77 or the emergent SU8, even more basically the emergent SU8 R symmetry um, uh, from the from the uh, from the Yang Mills side? Um, it's, it's a very good question. I mean, uh, it's it's been a long-standing problem that we don't see all the symmetries um, that is there for the gravity theory and the gauge theory. Uh, there's, there's been a little bit of progress. I mean, for example, there's been this work by Michael Duff and collaborators where they they explored, you know, how do, how do you get the full uh, SU8 of n equals eight? And I mean, they they explain it in terms of that you have to combine the R symmetry of the gauge series with the supersymmetry. Uh, because if you do one supersede transformation on one side and that uh, and a compensating one on the other side, it turns out that just you, you, you're not changing this the spin. Uh, so it's it's been sort of understand at that level. Um, that said, it, that doesn't explain why it works. I mean, just it's just say that if it works, it has to work like that. Uh, I mean, I because the, basically the, the, the multi soft limits is even more and has nothing to do with supersymmetry. It's just that. Yeah. That, that 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 in gravity we can have multi soft limits and th then supersymmetrized that turns into e seven seven, uh, but yeah mm. that that's that's another sort of qualitative thing. I see. Um, I, I, I just had another quick comment. There is actually another uh, comment slash question. Uh, uh, you you mentioned this uh, exotic ma magical fourteen dimensional supersymmetric theory that that I don't understand that yeah. you can't get in string theory. I just want to say that there is another example of something you definitely don't get in string theory. Which is there in the double copy business, uh, which are the Galileons. The Galileons are very sick, weird theories that they, they violate superluminality bounds, the dispersive bounds. They're, it's it. Uh, in fact, I, I I thought there are classic examples of garbage theories, um, except for the fact that they show up in a crucial way in the double copy story. So, I, 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 do you have any feeling for why? Well, anyway, do you have anything to do? You have anything to to, to say about this? Um, uh, they, they, I mean, they, they, they seem precisely because they show up in the double copy, they seem like much nicer than they would otherwise. If you didn't know about the double copy, you'd just throw these things out and never think about them. Um, but uh, do you have any feeling for why you get such a strange, uh, uh, non-local, uh, sort of otherwise crappy theory showing up in the double copy? Yeah, well, I mean, that's just, I'm, I'm sure you know there's, there's been some papers arguing that at least a special Galilee and has something to do with breaking of uh, spontaneous breaking of diffeomorphism invariance or similar to the the nonlinear nonlinear single model uh, has to do with the breaking of gauge symmetry. Oh no, there are lots of symmetry reasons for them, but there's a yeah. physical problem. I mean, they they have superluminality. 
that they're yeah. they're they're really thick theories. I mean, that, and that's why you never get them in string string theory. Um, yeah. But it's just fascinating that you get them. Now, so I I, I I somehow feel that there's probably they might have a, some purpose in life in the, I don't know like the, uh, Goldstone modes for some theory of, of uh, infinite power of massive higher spin particles, you know, a, a Higgs phase of a theory of massless, uh, massless right. higher spin particles, which if you happen to have a tree level or something, a truncation to only the spin two where you see the Galileo, but it wants to live as part of a much larger structure somehow. But, um, uh, I mean, yeah, I, I think, yeah. yeah, I mean, there, there's many, it's, this, I think this is not the only theory which is very interesting, but also sick. There's, the double copy gives many different kind of theories which are very interesting, but they're not always a consistent theories, of course, right? So, but, but, uh, uh, is, is your, uh, is your, what, can you just list some of the examples? So, for example, you, this funny, uh, this funny, no, no, that, 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 that funny theory with too many adjoint fermions, you wouldn't even start because it doesn't. Yeah, no, that I wouldn't consider. I but for example, there is there is this higher derivative uh, DF square theory that that somehow is very important for heterotic string amplitudes, I but the, the theory itself is not consistent, right? Um, oh, you mean, uh, sorry, DF squared is the, it, it, it you mean it's, it, it, it's it a, four a four derivative action? A four, four, de four derivative kinetic, kinetic term. Oh, yeah. I see, weird. Fascinating, yeah. I didn't know that. So it's, it's a very important theory because it actually shows up in the double copy of heterotic string, which I is, a, of course, a fine theory. But, but the Higgs theory by itself is not so meaningful. It has, uh, it has uh, well, it has tachyons and, or, or um, ghosts depending on... Uh, sure, sure. I yeah. see. Uh, there's also, I mean, I suppose a Z theory itself, which shows up in, in the supersymmetric uh, type one and type two string, I, I, don't, I think Z theory itself is actually not say, not consistent. I think it has to, it's not- Yeah, not, it, not, it has a ghost yeah. at the massive level, but that's a much more subtle problem that you yeah. could easily imagine fixing up. The, the right. sort of business with the Galileo is way more in your face. Well, and actually mm. this DF squared is much more in your face still. I mean, that's mm -hmm. very interesting. I didn't, I didn't know about that example. Thank yeah. you. Perhaps we can have another question from Lance. Hey, Henrik, nice talk. Hi. Thanks. I'm uh, intrigued by the fact that under open problems, you didn't list systematic construction of color kinematics duality satisfying multi-loop amplitudes. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, uh, specifically, do you have any further thoughts on what's going on at five loops? Oh. Um, not more than last time I got asked the question, I guess, which probably about that amplitude. By me also. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I, I have a guess, but I'm not sure if the guess is, is uh, the right. Uh, my guess is that it has something to do with supersymmetry. Uh, that, uh, I mean, we're, what basically what we're demanding is we're demanding that we can construct some local numerators which has full maximal supersymmetry and that seems maybe too strong um, to ask. Or for example, you can put it in another way. Imagine that you could write up a Lagrangian which produced um, kinematic numerators for N equals four to the Young-Mills. Uh, there's no way that could work because um, it wouldn't have manifest supersymmetry, for example, right? So, so I'm, I'm, I'm sort of tempted to say that maybe if you relaxed supersymmetry, the manifest supersymmetry a bit, for example, if you if you describe n equals four as n equals two plus two hypers, um, uh, then actually what you can do is you can actually relax some of the Jacobi identities. So you can relax, for example, a, a Jacobi identity which involves four hypers because it is no, no longer needed. Uh, so in that sense, you can get a system which is less constrained, right? Um, but in order to check this idea. You have to do n equals two super young Mills or n equals two super QCD calculation at five loops. So it's very hard to check this idea. Is this equivalent to uh, saying that the minus plus minus plus amplitude should have a different construction from minus minus plus plus for the for loop n equals four? Uh, not, when you said plus and minus, you mean gluons, I guess? No, I meant the uh, helicities of the external states. I mean, yeah, but okay, but the, okay, four, four point it could be fermions. That had a, you know, a single uh, factor out front because of the n equals four Suzy Ward identities. Mm, mm. I wondered if you could just relax somehow the uh, that as part of what you're saying without 
backing off yeah. this too. Well, one way to think of it is that uh, let's consider more fermions or more f fundamental fermions than um, n equals four has. Uh, well, you have you have to put them in fundamental if you want to have more. <laughs> Um, and and then, then of course what you will have what happens is that you will have like an S channel graph and you will have a T channel graph but the flavor structure is different right and then they're no longer related because of that yeah yeah all right thanks.